Good morning. There it is. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever in the world you may be. Hello. My name is Dave Wilbur, and my friends, colleagues, and others call me Turfgrass Zealot. Good morning. It's morning here where I am in beautiful Denver, Colorado, where since the time change, the sun is uh, the sun coming up. I guess it is. Yeah. Anyway. Hi, I'm Dave Wilbur, Turfgrass Consultant, Agronomic Advisor, uh, Communications Person, <laughs> Coach and Mentor, and and gosh, so many other, so many other great hats that I get to wear. Uh, speaking of hats, I was given this really great bear hat. I love it, man. Look at the bear paw, and uh, it kind of fits with my world. So, uh, nickname that has been given to me recently is Bear. People that don't know me in the turf grass industry call me bear. <laughs> so, which I know has some connotations in other cultures, but that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, never mind. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> so, anyway, God, I'm so glad to be here. I'm just kind of working out uh, sound levels and some stuff like that, you know? So, I, uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, I talk about this a lot. I'm actually, I'm, I'm forced to use copyright free music because of some of YouTube's laws, lists and regulations. <laughs> and I, I'm not always a big fan of some of the copyright free music I have access to. However, I, w I do want to say that I use uh, a service called Epidemic Sound and they are actually really amazing. Uh, as far as their work to make sure that content creators uh, don't get flagged and don't get uh, copyright strikes and all that sort of stuff, you know. So I'm uh, I'm giving it my best, and I really am. Um, let's see if this playlist may serve me a little bit better. I mean, some of the electronica is really good, but it's it's distracting, you know. So there it is. All right. Well, hey, we have uh, a lot of things to cover today. A lot of things to cover last week's episode was great um and we had a bunch of views we had some listens um and i want to go over a few of the questions that i got because it seems like turf heads they love to send dms and questions and they're not so great about like you know being out in the open and in the chat but i do want to remind you that the chat is open so please use that and if you haven't liked and subscribed please like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference in the YouTube algorithm. And um, this is uh, something I'm doing all on my own. So I, <laughs> I can use every bit of uh, support that I can. Uh, but I'm super stoked just to be able to use some technology, you know, and, and bring that technology uh, forward in a, in a way where it's like, you know, cause this is my home studio, man. I mean, this is, you know, this is, it's my space, a man cave, a gaming space, whatever you want to call it, right? And so I'm like, you know, I, I kind of, I'm actually really proud of being able to, um, of being able to bring this into fruition, if you will, um, as an independent person and, you know, somebody who just really likes to bootstrap and do it on my own. And that's kind of how I've been doing our business for a long time. So that's a good thing. A uh, couple of quick questions. Um, you know, golf course superintendent wrote me and said, should I be using Twitter? I see a lot of stuff on Twitter and I see you, you know, often having to deal with junk on Twitter and stuff like that. And I said, no. Here's the thing. Yes, you should be using Twitter. You should be using Instagram. And here's why. And I'm not talking about personally. Look, personally, you do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, but as far as your professional, your professional contacts, your professional world, you know, make, make a great Twitter feed and make a great Instagram feed. And I hate promoting Instagram because I hate promoting anything to do with the uh, with the Zuckerberg universe <laughs> is so to speak, but, um, but we are visual 
in our world, aren't we? And so uh, get a Twitter feed, get an Instagram feed, link them together, call it, you know, Coconut Creek Country Club agronomy or something, you know, to do with your work situation. You know, don't, don't, don't make it personal and don't, you know, I have my branding, right? The turf grass outlet, which was something that was given to me, but don't, you know, don't be, <laughs> I was just reading a tweet from somebody that's, you know, and I love this guy, right? But it's like, you know, it's turf monkey boy, you know, you know, don't do that. Don't, you know, don't be turf guy, turf grass genius 69 or, <laughs> you know, whatever, like don't, okay. You know, don't, don't play that game. Like be straight up, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, XYZ country club, XYZ golf club, XYZ golf course, agronomy, you know, or turf care team or whatever, you, you know, but make it about that. Right. And get some, get some photos going and get some stuff going and tell some quick stories about what's going on in your golf course, on your facility. Uh, make it real, make it human. Uh, don't make it boring. Um, yeah, I suppose people, you know, that slow motion, you know, of the mower passing by or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you do all that stuff, but you need to, yes, you need to be part of that thing. Okay, the answer is yes. You should be part of that. Oh, I don't have time for social media. I mean, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Especially when it comes to promoting, you know, your staff, your direction, and all that sort of stuff. Yes, you do. So there's the answer to that question. Um... This is a great question. What is the strategy for attending turf conferences? And how do I best get the best out of it? Because, you know, here we are to conference season, right? Of course, everybody does things a little bit differently. Uh, we just finished the Rocky Mountains annual conference. And, you know, we, we do that in such a way that we want people to be in the room and engaged and you know, all that sort of stuff. And yes, I know the hallway conversations are often more valuable. Yes, yes, yes. But I, I, I got to say that, like, in this day and age, why go if you're not going to sit and listen to some speakers and really catch it? You know, what? Why, why? Why even go? You know, if you're just showing up, just trying to show up and hang out in the hallway, I don't know. I don't know if that's the move. And I have a hard time sometimes sitting there for hours. So I get it. You know, you're going to get up a little bit, you know. Uh, but we see people show up and they spend the whole time, you know, not listening to speakers and stuff, you know. So I guess that's up to you. How should I attend curve conferences? I mean, honestly, you know, go with the idea that you're going to grab two or three really good ideas and put them to work. You know, go with the idea that you're going to see some people um, that you may not get to see in real life. Uh, go with the idea that you're going to get to see some people from down the road that you don't get to see <laughs> that often. So that's a good thing, right? Uh, this is a great question. What is your current shoe choice? And I was, I'm a shoe fanatic. I love shoes. I guess I have that Imelda Marcos gene. And I don't know. I just love shoes and my feet. My feet are important to me. Um, I have odd size feet. I have hobbit feet. I have wide, big feet, you know? So uh, shoes for me is like a thing. I'm a big fan of Merrill, the company Merrill, and I and I routinely wear Merrills, you know, for most of my stuff. And I've become a big fan of Skechers uh, because of their wide sizes have been so good for my feet, right? Uh, I also just ordered on the advice of another friend who has a similar deal. I ordered some Hoka one once and I'm super stoked to have those come. I wanted a certain color so they were back ordered. Um, on the daily, you know, for, for knocking around, I, you know, I wear some Adidas, but I've sort of been transitioning to Skechers because you can't really get Adidas in, in, you know, in wider sizes and my feet seem to be spreading <laughs> so there's that all right so that's good stuff uh what else let's see let me look at my list of questions um and the and the best question of the week is the one that we're going to jump into for our for our topic today uh what is your current eating strategy i love this 
and, and I know who this is from, and I think it's funny because because uh, they already know. Uh, my current eating strategy is I'm doing the 16-8 intermittent fasting thing. <clears throat> I, intermit I intermittent fast for 16 hours. I eat during an eight-hour period. Uh, I'm doing around 2,500 to 2,800 calories um, during that eight-hour period, and, uh, and I think that is pretty much between noon and 8 p.m. And that's working out for me. Uh, it's working out great, actually, in a lot of ways. And then inside of that, you know, I'm eating, I guess what you would kind of say, keto. I'm not re I'm not restricting my fats. Uh, I'm careful about carbs. And I have, uh, uh, I have one day a week where I, where I do whatever I want. But I still stay within the 16-8, right? So there's that. Well, that's what I'm doing. So if you want to look up 16-8 intermittent fasting, everybody has a lot of strategies about that, but it's certainly been working for me and I've been on this kind of slow weight loss thing and I have not lost any lean body mass, right? So I go get on the machine, whatever, what is it called? The in-body scanner and, you know, and I also have a, I have a lower grade one at the house, but I, so I can look at my lean body mass and I can say, okay, am I losing, am I losing lean mass? And then I change diet and stuff so so that's how that works for me and uh my health is um has you know has been an issue for me just because of <laughs> abusing my body in the past and being on the road way too many days and yeah so i ha i'm you know i'm probably having to be more careful than anybody else uh, let's see. One of the questions I got this week was about COVID and what my COVID strategy is. And it's like, look, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, let's just say that I mask up when I need to, when I'm, you know, when I'm in public and, you know, I, I, I'm pretty heavy on the disinfectants and the, and that stuff. And I, and I think that's what we all should be doing. And regardless of what you think you know or don't know or whatever, uh, I feel like keeping myself and everybody else around me safe. So there it is. Um, I don't, I just, I just don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I really don't. I don't really, don't love the, um, I don't really love the whole conversation that's happening in our world right now. And, um, you know, I mentioned last week that I, uh, that I'm doing some driving for one of the local school districts here and I'm frequently involved with some bunch of students and you know the rule is the federal rule is mask up right so i'm in the mask you know. and so are the kids and it's yes it's a drag it's a horrible thing for people and then there's a lot of you know but what's worse right you know there, at a certain point we have to kind of say well you know public health is important uh so there it is I, I, that's as far as i want to go with that question you know um all right, what's left here? I'm just looking at my list. I don't know, man. We we had a really good time. Um, somebody says, you know, talk about talk about your time. Uh, recently, they were in, they were curious as to like what it looked like with uh, with Dave Wilbur and Miranda Robinson hanging out together. You know, like what what was that show like? Uh, Miranda had been at the XL leadership thing. Uh, in, in Lawrence, Kansas, and then she came to Denver, um, and she was here. She went up to she went up to Vail, Colorado, to visit uh, uh, to visit Carrie and uh, I, Carrie Hoffner, and it, I don't know. It was just, just great, you know, great time, right? And then she spoke at the Rocky Mountain Conference, you know. So it was it was, and. Um, you know, guys in our business are so funny, right? Because it's like, well, you know, <laughs> are you and Miranda a thing? No, of course not. <laughs> Somebody asked me that. It's so funny. And uh, no, she has, a, she has a partner in British Columbia. She's, you know, she's got a guy. That's not it. She's a, no, that's my that's my friend. You know, that's my sister. Like I'm one of these people that's actually capable of having relationships with with uh, people of the opposite sex that you know, and and have them be my friends. But more importantly, is like, this is a professional colleague, right? I mean, we're talking about grass. Like, that's what we do. That's what we all do, right? We talk about grass and stuff. We talk about our jobs. We talk about the, 
you know, the golf pro. And then it's just what we do, right? So it's good. And, uh, um, you know, Miranda and I have both been advocates for mental health and for, for growth and change in that part of our industry. And we talk about that a lot. We talk about our personal stories a lot. Um, and that's a trusted thing. And I'm really, really happy to have, you know, that kind of brotherhood, sisterhood kind of thing. So, um, and, uh, you know, as far as, as far as turf grass conversation goes, man, and she, she, she can hold her own in that world, you know, uh, and, and, and I would expect nothing else. Oh, I mean, it, it, the gender thing doesn't matter when we really start talking about turf. You know, I just, oh man, our business has got to give it up when it comes to that stuff. I mean, we say we want to do better and be inclusive and all that. And then we just, you know, and then we, <laughs> guy walks up to me at the Rocky Mountain Conference and says, oh, this is so good. This is so hot. And I'm like, what? Like, stop that. You know, and I, and the guy was like, he realized what he'd done and like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And I'm like, yeah, what are you, fuck, dude, what are you doing? You know, just like, what is, what does being an attractive person have to do with the fact that somebody can stand up and deliver a great turf talk, right? I mean, Tyler Bloom was there. Tyler's amazing. He's a good looking guy. He's young, handsome. You know, he's got the zero head, thick shave thing going on. I mean, he looks great, right? So, you know, nobody walks up to me and says, oh, Tyler's so hot, right? Stupid. I just wish we'd all grow up a little bit. Really? I wish we'd grow up a little bit. Well, I see that we have some uh, people drifting in. I'm not really stalling, but I love that we have some concurrent viewers. And I see that there's people kind of viewing a little bit behind. So anyway, welcome. And again, please hit that like button. Please hit the subscribe button. That it makes a huge amount of difference for me. All right, let's get to it. I want to talk about relevance. The reason I want to talk about relevance is... <laughs> the reason I want to talk about relevance is because somebody asked me about being relevant in our business. Okay. And I was like, and this was on a coaching call. And by the way, quick commercial, I do, I do quick coaching calls with golf course superintendents. And, uh, it's, it's super great. We, it's also like, we're, uh, you know, it's super great. It's super confidential. Yeah. But I, there, it's a great, it's a great service that I offer. And I think in the COVID world, I couldn't always go make, you know, in-person visits. So we had to change the way we do things. And I actually make it really like financially. I think it's, it's a really good thing for some people. You know, they don't need to pay to fly me there. So anyway, um, on one of my co coaching calls, the golf course superintendent was asking me about being relevant. Okay. And at first I was like, I don't even know, like, what are you talking about? You know, like, where's that coming from? Relevant. Um, because, because when I was, when I was, when I spent my seven years with Sierra Pacific Turf Supply, directing the agronomy program there and selling, you know, let's be real. Uh, we talked a lot about relevant products and relevant ideas and all that sort of stuff, you know, so I, I, I really, you know, directly from a golf course superintendent had not necessarily heard, uh, you know, relevant, right? How do I stay relevant? And, and so it took me a minute. It took me a minute to kind of gather my thoughts around the whole thing. And I'm like, I'll tell you something. I, <laughs> I think that comes from a, you know, it comes from a place um, like it, like it comes from a place of, uh, um, of the, I think there's a fallacy of relevance, right? I mean, that's what I did. And, and so, you know, you type in relevance and you type in fallacy relevance, relevance and, you, and you get all this kind of cool philosophy stuff, right? And you get some critical thinking stuff and there's a lot of great stuff, you know, on the internet, if and uh, I have to say that all of those, you know, 
everything that we Google search is, is perfect. But there's a bunch of stuff that we used to talk about um, back in the day when I was first getting online at the well. You know, the well was always trying to figure out, you know, as far as online community, you know, what happens? Um, is this relevant or not? You know, are we doing the relevant thing, right? And then when you're talking about making, you know, when you're talking about discussion, you know, is that is that argument or is that discussion, is that idea relevant? You know, so I kind of, so I kind of drifted into it from that direction. And uh, there's some cool stuff out there. So let's talk about it. Like, and let's tie it to turf grass and tie it to our world. Um, you know, one of the fallacies of relevance is, is this idea of being popular, right? We all, do we all want to be popular? I don't know. I guess, I guess so in a certain sense. Here I am saying, hey, like and subscribe. Is that me saying, hey, I want to be popular? Probably. Um, but you know, the, the 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 popular the popular idea, the relevant popular idea, the ad populum, if you will, you know, is hey man, you better, you know, you better do this or you're not gonna be part of the cool crowd. You're not gonna be part of the in crowd. Right? You know, and that's and that's the fallacy. Since since when did doing or not doing, you know, from a popular standpoint really matter? Well, I guess it matters to tons of people. So that's why, you know, it's probably first on, the, on a lot of people's list, you know, about about the fallacy of relevance. Right? Unfortunately, what that does is it puts a lot of people in a place where they shouldn't be or doing things they shouldn't do. You know, the, the court of public opinion, right? You know, and the and the I want to be included, and we all want to be included. And, you know, inclusivity is a big word, isn't it? And we want to be included. I just noticed I have the sticker on the inside of my cap. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> squirrel ADD moment. So anyway, yeah, I think one of the fallacies of relevance is that you're going to be more popular. You know, and that the and that the popular idea comes out. You know, that everybody is doing it. Thing. Whoa, everybody is doing it. <gasps> Oh man, I bet we haven't heard that in the turf grass business, have we? Holy cow, everybody's doing it is a common sales technique that, you know, or all the or all the big all the big clubs are doing it. You know, that kind of thing. Right? So there's that. Um there's also that sort of, you know, that move to be relevant which is which is directed towards an appeal of emotion. You know, if you do this, you'll be happier. You know, if you join, you know, if, if you join up, and again, this is part of that, you know, it, it sort of tags onto the popular thing, but if like, you know, if you join up, you're gonna be pretty happy. Like this is gonna make you happy. You know, this is gonna, you know, or I guess the other side of that is if you, you know, if you kick into this idea, um, you know, like you could, you could end up being really sad, right? That could be a sad place for you. Now, if you go here, Dave Wilbur, Miranda Robinson, Paul McCormack, you know, any of those people talk about, you know, mental health, that could be, you know, it could, ah, that could bum me out, right? So, yeah. So that's part of it, right? That emotional appeal. It's a fallacy. It doesn't work that way. But it's used that way, sadly. All right, so when I first got on the, this, this next thing I want to talk about, when I first got on the well, you know, this is 1992, 93, in that neighborhood. And I didn't really understand that the well was a virtual community, that it was a, you know, that it was a conversation space. I just needed an email address. I did. I needed an email address because I was working with a couple of university types and I needed, uh, and it won a consulting firm in San Francisco and I need, and they were communicating via email. And in 92, 93, there weren't a lot of people doing that, right? And it was, you know, AOL was not connected up to the net per se, so you couldn't really at AOL.com anybody. So I had to get it. I had to get a legit email address, and the well in San Francisco offered that, right? You could pay, you know, 10 bucks a month or whatever, be a member of the well, or 15 bucks, whatever it was, and that got you that got you an email address. And my first email address was 
was WTSS for Wilbur Turf and Soil Services, Dave, WTC, WTSS Dave at uh, well.sf.ca.us, right? That was the, that was the, you know, that was the email address. And, and it turns out that having a well address was a little bit of like, hey, hey, you got a department on Fifth Avenue kind of thing, right? Ooh, you're a well member? I got that right away from some people. Like, well, what do you mean? Well, they have this huge conferencing thing. They're the leaders in virtual community. You know, they've, oh, okay. We'll check it out, right? Then I ended up falling into, um, into, into the well in a really, really good way. And there were a whole bunch of us Gen Xers that were just kind of coming up in the world. A lot of them were tech people and writers and, and uh, there were a lot of writers on the well. And uh, I was really trying to improve my writing skills. And somebody said, hey, man, if you want to be a good writer, write. You know, so, so you know, a couple thousand words a day on the well <laughs> made me a pretty good communicator. It was one hell of a good boot camp. And there were a lot of really, really smart people there. There were people from, you know, Stanford Research Institute and, uh, you know, Gerard Vanderloon from General Media, Tom Mandel from Stanford Research Institute. These were people that suddenly I was, you know, interacting with. David Crosby was there. Music people were there. David Gans, you know, host of the, you know, the Grateful Dead Hour. Uh, there were radio people. There were, there were communicators. And they all were kind of seeing the light. Like, hey, this is, we don't know what this is, but it's coming. And there was a ton of discussion. Some of it was gnarly, man. I mean, you want to talk about flame wars. Oh, these guys could heat each other up. But you had to come correct. You had to come, If you were going to jump into an argument or a, or have a position or whatever on the well, you, <laughs> you better have your stuff together, right? So there was a lot of talk about whether or not, you know, words were relevant and all that sort of stuff. And one of the things, one of the first things I heard was the word red herring. You know, and I remember vividly um, this woman, Kathleen Crichton, who was, who was brilliant writer, you know, went after somebody one day and said, well, that's just a red herring argument. And I didn't know what that meant. Right. So I remember asking somebody or, you know, private messaging somebody or what I, I forget. We had sense back then. It was a really funky interface, man. I mean, you had to know Unix. I had to learn Unix or at least a, a piece of Unix. And then they had a they had a piece inside of that that was written in Unix called PicoSpan, and there were commands. It was all command line oriented. You know, it was no graphical thing. And uh, so, yeah, man, I hear this red herring. What is that? What is that? That's a red herring. Well, what that was is a total diversion, a distraction. You know? So, in other words, somebody would be talking about, um, I don't know, let's just pick some things out of thin air. You know, somebody we'd be talking about how to train your dog. Because, like, on the Well the Pets conference was a, was a cool place, right? So it was, hey, you know, better dog training. And I remember one of my friends, Ken Worth, who was an aspiring dog trainer, who was, and we were both into Rottweilers and stuff, and she was just talking about stuff. And somebody kind of comes in and says, you know, here, the, the, the real problem here is that, you know, um, the, the, the cats are just better than dogs, right? The topic is all about dogs. The topic is about dog training. The topic is about how to raise your Rottweiler puppy. And, and, you know, some goon rolls in and says, well, cats are just better than dogs. That's the real story. Okay. That's a, you know, that's a, you know, gross, a gross example. Uh, you know, let's pull that to turf grass a little bit. You know, a couple of us are debating, um, you know, some fertility strategies, right? You know, this much, let's talk about this this way, this much nitrogen, that much nitrogen, you know, this kind of thing, right? And somebody arrives into that discussion, you know, whether it be online or face-to-face -face and says, well, you know, really, you know, that, you know, that whole thing is about, you know, polluting the environment. Okay, I mean, I'm sure there's something to that, right? And it, and it is connected by the thinnest of threads, but it is a distraction. 
from the real conversation, from the real topic. And so that's what, you know, the red herring argument is. And so sometimes even now, like on Twitter and stuff, I'll say, well, that's just a red herring. And people are like, what? What is that? You know, it means, well, it means it's just, you know, it's just, it's just a fish of a different color, right? It's just something else that you've thrown in there. And, and obviously I'm really trying to stay away from politics in the examples, but you know, you can, you know, you can see this, right? The popular thing, the appeal, to emotion, the distraction, the total diversion, you know, but what about a lot of times that's what that starts. Okay. So it's a real fallacy of, of being relevant that that kind of thing really works. It does not, it just detracts. Okay. And then along the same lines is, is uh, and this again was another thing that the first time I ever heard it, I heard it on the well in the early 90s, the straw man argument. And they would say, well, that's a straw man. You know, you're just, you're just bringing in the straw man. I <laughs> thought, and, and what, that, what that was about was just, it was a misrepresentation of something, you know? And so the example would be, uh, you know, let's, let's, uh, Let's make a turf grass example. You know, the misrepresentation would be that turf grass uses a haul of water, right? You know, we should be irrigating because turf grass, you know, that, that, well, that's the straw man argument, you know, and, and you take it one step further and you could, you could even, you know, kind of link the straw man and the red herring together and say, well, turf grass uses a ball of water and, um, that way there won't be any food. Right, like that's that, that's that sort of dramatic thing, you know, reaching for relevance in a bad way. So the straw man is the risk misrepresentation. And again, I'll say it on Twitter. I said, you know, that's 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 a straw man that just burns. It just doesn't mean anything, right? Wood, hay, and stubble. Okay, so there it is. Uh, let's talk about another piece of of the fallacy of being relevant when somebody talks about the attack or the argument, you know? Um, and again, this is, <laughs> this is huge in our culture right now. I mean, I, I'm not going to talk politics. I just don't, we get enough of that, don't we? Um, but it's huge in our culture right now, you know, to just go on the attack, right? But I was thinking about this as I was putting this, as I was kind of putting this talk together and I was thinking, man, you know, there's some, there's some ad hominem and this, and the, you know, the, the ad hominem attack, right? The, uh, the ad hominem attack. I'm not saying that very well, but you know, that, that ad hominem thing. And basically it's just like, we do this, right? We'll do this. We'll, you know, and one of them is like, you know, so making somebody irrelevant by saying, well, have you ever grown grass? You know, I mean, that's really just kind of an attack. And I do, I do it. I do, you know, I've done it at some pretty heavy green committee meetings and board meetings and stuff. Well, you know, have you ever grown grass? You know, have you ever had your uh, life on the line for a tournament? You know, that kind of stuff, right? So that is kind of a, that is kind of an ad hominem thing, right? But the grosser thing is like, well, you know, <laughs> you just wear red shirts all the time, Dave. You're not a, you know, what do you know? Huh? So again, here's the distraction, the red herring, and then here's the personal attack, right? You know? Um, I mean, yeah, it gets pretty, if you start thinking about, you know, think about how we have learned as humans to dig into somebody, man, you go right for the person. Yeah, well, that guy's a goon, man. Have you, have you see how he walks down the street? Can't imagine him having any good ideas. Yeah, that is the ad hominem attack, right? That is the way to, um, you know, to destroy relevancy or to just, you know, create a fallacy around it, right? And so that's like a big thing. And we'll do that. Again, in researching this, I realize how much of that is, you know, is part of is kind of can be part of my, you know, it's, you're competitive, right? You know, nah, nah, I'm better than that, better that person, you know, that sign of winning thing. You know, what about what about a certain group or whatever? Like, oh, uh, you know those, you know those guys in Colorado, they don't know how to grow grass. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> that that one chapter, man, they're just, they're just hicks. You know, they're backwards, right? Or they're whatever they are. See, you know, that kind of thing. That's really the ad hominem attack. So it's pretty good. All right. How about just the forceful thing? Like, again, trying to be relevant by, by you know, appealing to force, right? The, the term that I learned is ad baculum. I had never heard that before. I'd heard ad hominem, you know, straw man, red herring. But the ad baculum thing, it's like the threat, right? And, and this happens in our business, doesn't it? If you don't do this particular thing, use this particular product, think this particular way, you, you could you could kill a bunch of grass. You could lose your job. Right? I mean, it gets worse. How about the, you know, man, if I tell everybody what you just said, it can be bad. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, the appeal of force. the You know, essentially the bully, right? Being relevant by bullying is, is no bueno. But we do it. I've done it. And so now that I hear that and I recognize it, and this is why I'm talking about this today, because if you recognize these things, you know, if you recognize these things, then, you know, you're either going to, you're either going to have the tools to not do it yourself, or you're going to have the tools to say, well, I, I, uh, I just had this happen to me, man. I just, I just had a, you know, a green committee member essentially just like tell me that I wouldn't be relevant if I didn't do, you know, whatever this thing was that he thought I should do. And then I went back at him and said, well, what do you know about growing grass? See, and now we're in war. <sighs> Missiles firing each other. Okay. So that's, you know, that's, that's the appeal to force, right? The ad baculum. How about just missing, missing the point that, <laughs> I love this. The word for that is ig ignoratio, right? Ignorance, missing. you're missing the point. You're completely missing a point. You know, you're, <laughs> you're telling somebody they're not relevant because, hey, you know, you don't get it, right? You've completely missed the point. Or you direct the conversation. And again, this, you know, goes into the other things to, you know, to make sure somebody misses the point, right? So either one of those is ignorant, is based out of ignorance. You know, you just just don't know, right? You, you know, you're trying to be relevant, but you don't know. And, the, and therein lies the fallacy. All right, so how about, how about the, <clears throat> this is a great one, the appeal to pity, right? Like, I'll lose, you know, like, like, uh, uh, Geez, I feel like I'm I'm beating up on our commercial members, but it's like, hey, you know, if you don't do the early order, you know, I'm gonna, it's like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to have my job. I mean, it's got nothing to do with finance. It's got nothing to do with agronomy. It's just like, you know, I'm, I could lose my job if I don't get your business, right? Yeah, appeal to pity. Trying to be relevant via pity. You know, speaking to speaking to a golfer and saying, you know, if you, you know, if you get all upset like that and go tell the pro shop, I could be, you know, they'll whip me <laughs> like a mule, you know, or whatever. See that kind of thing, right? That pity thing. Oh, woe is me! It's a horrible thing, you know. Yeah, it's an ugly way to be relevant, and it is a false thing. How about the how about the appeal to people like in the larger sense how about the appeal to people like you know the crowd mentality thing hey we are being wronged you know we we turf grass consultants are just not we're just not looked at as real in this business <laughs> i don't know you know i'm just i mean how about that you know like i want to get this crowd together i want to be relevant to them i want to tell them that that you know that we're, we're we are suffering, we're suffering the great the great loss. And again, you know you can think about how this has been used in history, right and wrong, because some groups have been oppressed and suffered and done wrong and all that sort of stuff, right? But how about when that 
really hasn't happened or it's really not a thing. You know, that emotionally charged language, you know, that, you know, filled with words like, you know, rights and freedom and, and uh, you know, determination. You know, those, those, you know, those big words, right, that are just, you know, they invoke that emotion, right, the appeal. And then the indirect side of that is we as a group could be excluded if we don't do X, Y, and Z, right? You know, if we don't band together and do this thing, then we're never going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I've been part of that stuff. Like some people have said that kind of thing to me. Hey, you know, we better do this or, or else. And it's, it's, not, it's not really based on any real, you know, if you really look at it, it's like, you know, one of, the, one of, my, one of my spiritual teachers used to say, you know, let's look at that and say, what is so, right? It's a mindfulness exercise. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Is that so? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's give that one up, right? Um. You know, if I don't do this, if I don't do that, I won't be part of this. Really? Is that so? I don't know. You know, people try to be relevant by doing that, and it doesn't work that way. You know, and then along those lines, like that. <laughs> That last bit, which this is, you know, this is a tough one. Like the exclusion part comes with, you know, comes with snobbery. All right, let's be snobs. Let's be snobs about it. You know, and then, and then we'll look relevant. Or let's be vain about something. You know, like, I, you know, I have to do this because this is the vain thing. And worse yet is, you know, let me, let me do, let me do this thing because I'll be a celebrity. Man, if I can pull this off, everybody's going to know about me. That, uh, that is a fallacy of re relevance. It's not necessarily the case. Not really the guarantee, is it? Hey, it happens sometimes. Sure, of course. You know, I want to be known. I'd love it if everybody knew Dave Wilbur. I mean, uh, would I love it? I don't know. Might have to take that one back. But you know, hey, oh, you know, I, I, sure, I'd love to have a few of my accomplishments, you know, hanging as the flags that, you know, that I, so I don't have to talk about it, right? I already, you know, I'm already in the club because I did X, Y, Z, or because I traveled this many days, or you know, whatever it was, right? Because I understand this or that about architecture, construction, you know, it is a vanity snobbery, celebrity kind of thing, and it, and it makes people think it's going to be make them relevant and it's not it's just not so what so what if all this is the fallacy of you know i've just and i've just gone through you know those things right the ad hominem the straw man the red herring and all that sort of stuff these are you know these are things that we say are relevant but they're not a part of relevancy but they're not so what is being relevant mean Remember a, another spiritual teacher of mine said, man, that word relevant, it is sticky glue, man. It is a, what do you say? It is a sticky, sticky word. Relevance. Um, and he was using it in the, in the context of, you know, trying to reach people, um, you know, in a, in a spiritual or religious kind of way, right? It's like, well, that being relevant is a sticky thing because it, sometimes can make you do stuff that you don't want to do or shouldn't be doing like all those things that I just told you so the question to ask really is is relevant is being relevant in our business in the turf grass business really a thing should that be a thing that we worry about I think when you say a word over and over and over again it uh it starts to kind of lose its, you know, it loses its ump, right? And in, in doing the work for this, in doing the work to, uh, you know, to talk to a superintendent about relevance, because their question had, had kind of, you know, spun me back a little bit. So I, you know, so I'm looking at the, 
the definition and it says, you know, relevance from the dictionary standpoint, it, it says the quality or state of being closely connected or appropriate. This film is contemporary relevance and it's like, oh man, that really is sticky glue. You know? And then another, you know, another thing was like, hey, relevance is, is how appropriate something is to what's being done or said at a given time. An example of relevance is like someone talking about pH levels in soil in a gardening class. Right? That's relevant, isn't it? Yeah, we're, you know, we're taking the, you know, how to how to grow stuff class and, and we're talking about soils and pH and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's relevant, right? But then what if we're taking this gardening class and we're talking about soil, you know, we're, and we're working through some of those problems and somebody says, well, you know, all the soil is gone from blah, 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 but, or whatever, right? Or, hey, hydroponics is really the way to go. So there it is, right? The fallacy of trying to be relevant. Um, is there another word for it? Let's see, I looked up some synonyms. Important significance connection application pertinence wow so yeah man i i definitely you know i can see like and then what if you're not relevant like what is the opposite because i like to look up opposites of words sometimes you know and like it's in 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 applicably <laughs> Irrelevant, right? That's the obvious one, right? You're irrelevant or you're in irrelevant. So I kind of, you know, with that. The thing is, I think is that, you know, we go, well, is this person or is this concept, is this idea, is this situation or whatever worth it for me? Is that relevant to my current situation? You know? When I was first getting involved in radio, because I was doing the broadcast radio thing for a little bit in college and stuff, thinking that maybe I was going to go that direction. Because, you know, I had the voice and the mind for it. You know, I, I had zero, you know, mic fright, right? Sit down in front of the microphone and go for it. And especially if it had to do with music, you know, I felt like my knowledge was good. I mean, all those sorts of things. And one of my... One of my teachers in that world, a guy named Chris Bjork, who went on to be like a production director and do some really cool stuff in radio, um, you know, said, said, Dave, this is it. You know, you, you can either do this or you can't. You know, it's kind of like acting. It's kind of like, you know, you, it's, this is kind of a, he explained it as kind of a Darwinian kind of deal, you know, and it doesn't, you can't do it. You're not going to get, you know, you're not going to be on the air, right? So that was like, oh, shit. I mean, what is this? This is the natural talent for sitting and talking, you know, with, and with, you know, with the wall, with a soundproof thing. And, you know, back then there weren't even computer monitors, you know, <laughs> but then he looked at me, he says, so what you do is you relax, you be real and you relate to your audience. So relevant, relate. Okay. You hear where I'm going with that, right? So, okay. We want to gain relevance. We want to be real. We want to relax. We want to do that. Hmm, real, relax, relate, be real. So I did some digging, man, and I found, I found, I found the teachings of, again, another, um, of another spiritual teacher that I like in it. Uh, and then I dug in a little bit deeper and I just found that there was some common threads in all this and I wrote some notes and I said, you know, the part of being relevant, you know, is finding solutions. Like these are the good parts, right? This isn't the fallacy stuff. This isn't the making the stupid argument. This isn't scaring people into doing it. This isn't picking a group and saying, well, you know, they are, or they aren't, you know, whatever. Right. But how about just finding a solution? And this guy Osho said, the problem that you want to forget is the stuff that enhances its relevance. And I'm like, 
quo. The problem you want to forget. <laughs> when I was thinking about that for turf fast, for life, and I'm like, wow. Man, that is huge. Find the solution to the problem you want to forget. <laughs> that is that is relevance in greatness. How about just the passion to serve? You know, I want to be relevant. Okay, well, serve. Just serve people. Serve serve the community. Serve animals. Whatever whatever that means. Serve. Right. And then along those same lines, like, okay, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be relevant in service, how about I'm compassion? How about I show compassion? Well, how about I'm compassionate? How about I have standards that lead to compassion? Ooh, ooh, Dave, what are you talking about? Safe space, coloring books? No, man, I'm just saying, hey, listen, you know, do I have empathy? Do I understand, you know, what the, what's going on here? And then do I want to make it better? Yeah, I understand how this got this way on the golf course. I get it, you know? And then I want to fix that. I want to work that solution. It's a great key to personal relevance and job relevance and all that. Um, overcoming isolation. This was such a good one. So one of the common themes in my studies about all this was that is that, you know, when you overcome isolation and you're being engaged in something you are becoming more and more relevant now that does not mean that all i have to do is put myself in front of a whole bunch of people and then i'm good no no like like you're engaged in something it's you're making a difference somehow and that and and it is bigger than just you know doing it yourself essentially doing for others, right? That compassion to serve. This is all tied together, isn't it? How about resilience, man? I'm resilient. I'm relevant because I'm resilient. I'm I'm standing in there. I'm going to get it done. I'm I'm I can take the hits, you know? I can take the punches. And again, in thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, am I a resilient person? Not always. Sometimes I'm pretty rigid. But I don't know, is rigid and resilient, you know, like, no, I don't think so. I think you can kind of actually be a little bit dogmatic and a little bit, you know, but also it's like understanding that, hey, man, the, the world is probably going to throw you some curveballs. You know, there's going to be some stuff. You know, and can you, can you resolve through it? Can you resilient, can you be resilient? In it? I love that. I love that. Okay, yeah, this happened and, you know, bummer. And then we're going to figure out how to move it. Make it better. Love that. Another thing that I found that was pretty cool about about um, gaining relevant relevance was honesty. And then honesty linked to kindness. Like, I'm kind, you know, like, I try to be kind, but I can be kind of hardcore, right? And then I'm thinking, well, yeah, then there's the honesty part. And sometimes brutal honesty in my world has to happen. I had to, this is a great, this is a great example. And it's interesting that it happened this week. I had to block a semi long time Twitter follower. Somebody who, I don't know, I don't know if they're influential or not. I really don't, you know, don't look at it that way, but it's just somebody that I've known for a while. Somebody who thought that they um could tell me how to run my life and um they had a criticism of myself and some others and they wanted to be relevant right so it's like dropping into my dms and saying this that or the other and i'm like you know what cross the line don't do that you know you, first of all you don't know the whole story and i can't tell you and the second thing is it's just too much you know like what are you doing i don't really know you and so then it was like, it kept up, right? A couple more DMs, a couple more things, a couple, you know, a couple more kind of, you know, attacky kind of things. It's like, you know what? I just got to be honest with you. I'm going to give you some tough love right now. Oh, stop reading my shit. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> so I don't know. Seems a little unkind, but it was honest. Tough love kind of deal. Maybe that person and I will talk that through sometime. You know, maybe. I think so. Yeah, I think we will, but it's not going to be today or tomorrow. Um, so I would, I would love to, I would love, 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 love to work towards being a kinder person who also has kind of the honesty thing going on about that and speaking when I need to and not using that, you know, red herring straw man, you know, oh, everybody's doing it, you know, or everybody's not doing it. Why are you doing it? kind of idea. This seems like good leadership, right? Hey, that's interesting. We're all in leadership positions, aren't we? <laughs> we're, we're in some kind of leadership position in turf grass management. Some way, somehow, all of you are. Anybody who's listening to this is. And then you want to be relevant in that situation, right? Well, it certainly isn't by bullying people. It certainly isn't by, you know, changing this changing the argument, you know, how about being compassionate? How about being passionate and serving? How about finding solutions? How about being grateful for the situation that you're in? How about being honest and kind? It sounds a little bit touchy-feely, a little bit woo-woo, but if you really put your mind to that, and again, I've had some time to really work with this, and it, it, I got excited about it, and I was like, you know what? I really, really, I can cut some, I can cut some ways out of my world I can also deal with some people who, who only have, you know, that fallacy of what is relevant and say, well, no, let's look at the solution. Let's look at what kind of has to happen here, you know, for, from an honesty point of view. Let's be resilient in this moment and try to figure out a way through this problem. Boy, that's a big one, isn't it? Man. I'm thinking back to, to some of the great golf course superintendents that I've had a chance to, to meet and work with and been fortunate enough to, to, you know, to hang out with them or their staffs or whatever, you know, and, and one of the things that really rings true to me and I, you know, and I love this and here I go trying to, you know, put a group together and I'm not doing that. That's not it. I think I would have almost stopped there, but if I go a little bit further and say, man, I realize that passion, compassion, engagement, resilience, all those sorts of things, you know, like those are, those are some of those qualities that I've seen from those people. And yes, we've had successful yellers and screamers and we've had successful bullies and, yeah, you know, yes, okay? But where are those people now? I can think of a few folks in the world of turf grass who have been who have made who have made it happen despite you know some pretty tough stuff and you gotta say wow that's resilient and then you look at them and you say man they're serving and they're being and oh it starts to make sense you know they're not spending all their time arguing with people they're not spending all their time attacking them they're not spending all their time saying well yeah but you know what about her emails no 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 just kidding but you see what I'm getting at? Okay, so the, the original question. Dave, how do I stay relevant in our business? Well, it seems like as we're figuring all this out together, that part of it is having passion and compassion. Part of it is being grateful for the situation that you're in. Part of it is being resilient for how you can get things moving in the right direction, you know, without hurting others. Because you have compassion. Huh. Huh. Interesting. This has been really enlightening for me. The last piece, you know, is the kindness and the honesty part. And again, I don't always think that honesty is, is mild. You know, I think sometimes we have to be honest with people. But we, but we are also doing them a kindness. And I'm not talking about, you know, hey, the... <laughs> the golf course superintendent went to me and said, you know, he's really upset with an assistant and like, man, that's just, I gotta just take that dog and shoot him in the head. 
a really bad way to say that you know I, I know what he was trying to say he was like i just don't think this person is going to fit in my organization and i'm not doing any of us any good by having them around right oh okay so that's like the honesty with kindness thing and i learned later that the super you know really had a long talk with that assistant and you know it's like there was a lot of stuff going on in that person's life and he said you know listen you know, stick around here. We'll find you a job. They needed to get closer to their family, which is clear across country. And it worked, you know, they helped, they worked each other out, right? There was an honesty, there was a kindness, you know, and that, that makes you a relevant leader. I think that's it. I think, I think by virtue of digging in a little bit, from a real, from what seemed like a really simple question, you know, because at first I was like, relevant, you know, this is this kick ass, and you know, and you know, win, 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 win. <laughs> like I just, you know, was, I wanted to be dismissive for a second about that. Like, fuck, who cares about being relevant? Just go. But then I realized, you know, that, that part of that, you know, that fallacy of relevance is this court of public opinion kind of thing. And, you know, what about just being, you know, what about getting it together from from the personal side? It has been a huge lesson for me. And I hope it's been a good lesson for you. I hope in my sharing of, of the discovery of something, you know, good, that you will uh, take that and apply that and use that in some good way. Yeah. All right, great. Well, listen, I, that's it. That's my hour. I think we're good. I think we're done. I think we are in a place where I feel like I am relevant. <laughs> I don't know. I'm so glad to be part of this. Thank you. If you've taken the time to uh, to read, watch, listen, whatever it is that you're doing, I think you can turn on the closed captions here. <laughs> Actually, I wonder how that translation turns out for Wilburisms. Uh, but anyway, we're really, really fortunate to have you here. And again, your likes, your subscribes, all those things, they make a huge difference. Uh, you are making a huge difference in your world. And I know that. So my name is Dave Wilbur, agronomic advisor, consult, turf grass communicator, all those things. My friends call me the turf grass zealot. And um, I am grateful for your... Uh, participation in my world today <laughs> and i'm super stoked about what this may turn out to be in your life in your career please have a fantastic day have a fantastic week and uh, whatever time frame that you're watching this in i hope that you apply all this to your world and uh and make a difference that's it that's what i've got you guys take care. Have a great day.